Today on Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. For many today, the institution of marriage still seems like a good idea, but it's not a thought out idea. Marriage is a moving target today. People get to draw their own target around marriage. But what's true of the culture must never be true of the church. We're in the world, yes, but we're not of the world. It's philosophy, it's trends don't shape us. Although the family is society's cornerstone, its foundation is crumbling. But today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy discusses God's blueprint for marriage and its power to transform communities. Through Ephesians 5, we'll discover seven divine purposes for marriage that combat modern social ills. From partnership to pleasure, we're learning how strong families create a thriving society. It's the second part of our message, Wedding Plans, from the Life Together series. You'll find part one at ktt.org. Here's Pastor Philip DeCourcy with today's message. Well, let's take our Bibles and turn to Ephesians 5, verse 22 to 33. We're in the book of Ephesians, Life Together, and we have not stumbled but entered upon a passage here that deals with marriage. And I want to spend a few weeks just working my way through it. We're taking the big picture this morning, as we did last week, and trying to answer the question, why? Why marriage? What's God's purpose in marriage? And then next week, we'll look at the what and the how. What is it? And how do we act within it as husbands and as wives? What is the role the Bible has indeed defined for a man and a woman together? But if you were with us last week, we started a two-part sermon entitled The Wedding Plans. God's got wedding plans for your wedding. God's got purposes for your marriage and we want to understand them. We've covered two last week, and we'll cover another five this morning together. Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself. Let the wife see that she respects her husband. So reads God's word. The story is told about a boy who received a bow and arrow from his father and immediately went outside for some target practice. Later, the father went outside and saw that his son had shot some arrows at several targets he had drawn on the side of the barn. He was amazed to see that the boy had hit the bullseye on each shot. And he turned to his son and he said, you're a natural. I didn't realize you were such a good shot. To which his son replied, oh, dad, it's easy. I shoot the arrows and then I draw the targets. (laughs) Now, the story is a parable of how many people approach marriage today. They move ahead without any clear target in mind. If they have goals at all, 
They are usually self-defined, self-serving. They're usually suited to the couple in particular. For many today, the institution of marriage still seems like a good idea, but it's not a thought-out idea. They don't have any clear purposes as they enter marriage. They kind of go in with one eye closed and one finger crossed. In fact, ours is a society where you get to draw your own target around marriage. We have trial marriages through cohabitation, homosexual marriages, transgender marriages, non-monogamous marriages, polygamous marriages, and marriages where the thought of having children is excluded. Marriage is a moving target today. People get to draw their own target around marriage. But what's true of the culture must never be true of the church. We're in the world, yes, but we're not of the world. Its philosophy, its trends don't shape us. Romans 12, 1 to 2 tells us not to be pressed into the mold of this world, but to be renewed in our mind that we might know what the will of God is and do it. The church doesn't go along to get along. In fact, we saw, didn't we, back in chapter 4, verse 17 of Ephesians, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. When we became Christians, we didn't about turn. We started driving against the traffic. The church doesn't go along to get along. The church marches to a different drum beat. We keep in step with the Spirit, and Jesus is leading the parade. And if that's the case, then the disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, for them, marriage is a creation ordinance, lovingly provided by and clearly defined by the Creator. Marriage had a beginning with God at the beginning. It's not a human invention. It's not a cultural convention. It's a divine provision. Isn't that what Jesus taught us when he was dealing with divorce and remarriage in Matthew 19? He said, hold on a minute, guys. Before we answer the question of divorce and remarriage, let's go back to the beginning. Because it was never God's intention that divorce would be part of the human experience. In the beginning, there was a man and a woman, and God created an institution which would involve them leaving mother and father, joining to each other, becoming one flesh, and indeed producing children. Marriage had a beginning with God at the beginning. It's a kind provision from an all-wise God. And according to Hebrews 13, verse 4, it ought to be honored among all men because it is honorable. God is the author of life. If we believe that, in the beginning, God. If God is the author of life, you know what? Then he's the authority on life. And he has established marriage, and he has defined it as we find it in Scripture and taught by the Lord Jesus. Let me just give you a definition of marriage. I came across this one several years ago by John Stott, an evangelical Anglican in England. It's as good as any I have seen. Marriage is an exclusive heterosexual covenant between a man and a woman. One man one woman, ordained and sealed by God, preceded by the leaving of parents, consummated in sexual union, issuing in a permanent mutual supportive partnership, and normally crowned by the gift of children. That's a mouthful, but every one of those words are chosen carefully. And that's a good statement. The church doesn't get Neither do you get to draw a target around your own marriage. You've got to follow the maker's manual. We need to hear what Mary said to the guests and to the host at the wedding in Cana. Remember what Mary said? Whatever he says to you, do it. So let's come back to Ephesians 5, 22 to 33. Now, we haven't got into the thick of the text yet, and we won't until the next time we're together. But we've sought to answer the why question. We tend to answer three questions when it comes to marriage. Why, how, what? What is it? How do we pull it off? 
and how do we love each other? But what about the why? Why does it exist? What is God's design and purpose for marriage? We'll see before we're done here in Ephesians 5, 32, that one of the purposes of marriage is to project and reflect the love that Christ has for his bride, the church. Before there was a marriage between Adam and Eve, there was a marriage in the mind and heart of God between Christ and his bride, the church. And that's what Paul tells us here. I want to tell you, marriage is a great mystery, but he doesn't leave us hanging in suspense. And the mystery is that every marriage is a reflection of Christ's love for his church. Hold that thought. But every human being, by virtue of being a human created by God, is to love God. That's their primary obligation. You have a primary obligation in life, and that's to glorify the God who made you for his glory. Revelation 4.11, everything exists for his glory and for his praise. And if that's the case, then if you're going to glorify God, if you're going to love God, you need to align your desires to his desire, align your will to his will. And if that's true for life in general, it's true for sex and marriage in particular. What is the Creator's will in marriage? And that's what we're seeking to answer here. What are the purposes God established for marriage? I like the story of General Ulysses Grant going to Scotland. And while he was there, he was introduced to a game called golf. He had never played it, never seen it. So this particular man wanted to introduce Ulysses Grant to the game, and so he teed up the ball, and he took a swing at it and completely missed. He did it again and completely missed. The third time, he missed the ball, hit the ground. The only thing flying through the air was a clod of dirt. And this went on for a little bit, and then Ulysses Grant said this, there seems to be a fair amount of exercise in the game, but I fail to see the purpose of the ball. Well, we want you to understand what the purpose of marriage is, what God designed it for. Now, we looked at partnership and prosperity last week. It's not good that man should be alone, so God made for him a comparable helper, that together in partnership, they might fill the earth and tend the garden, basically do the will of God. Then we looked at prosperity, the first institution was marriage. The first school is the home. The first hospital is the home. The first government is the home. The home is the building block of society. And when societies regulate marriage and honor marriage the way God has intended for all people, then societies prosper. If children obey their parents, it tends to go well with them. Ephesians 6 verse 3. Now we're coming to a third purpose. This is where you want to start writing again. Partnership, prosperity. Number three, procreation. This is a purpose for marriage. Another clear intent that God has attached to marriage between a man and a woman, the bearing of children. Genesis 1 verse 28. Multiply. Fill the earth. Listen, if you choose to marry you have no choice but to have children because God has attached the bearing of children to marriage. We could it start normally. Marriage is crowned with the gift of children. There may be circumstances that don't allow that to happen. There may be physical issues that don't allow that to happen. I get that. But normally, marriage ought to be crowned with children. They were told to go forth and multiply it's not a hell I'll die on. I was interested to read this week. A Wayne Grudem says the word multiply seems to imply probably more than two children. Again, I'm not going to die on that hill. I've got three, so I'm okay. <laughs> Here's the reason he gives. Just think about it. It's not a bad thought. If you have two children, you've just replaced yourself. You haven't multiplied. That's his thinking. Take it or leave it. But here's the point we're making. Have children. God wants you to have children. The two shall become one in sexual union, and becoming one, they'll become two, and sometimes three, sometimes four, sometimes five, and more. 
Marriage is a matter of subtraction. Leave mother and father. Marriage is a matter of addition. Join yourself to another in a covenant relationship of the opposite sex. And marriage is a matter of multiplication. Bear children. As one writer says, add to the gardening team. What does he mean by that? Christopher Ash, in his book on marriage, talks about, hey, God put Adam in the garden to tend it and saw that he was alone. And so he brought a partner in there so that they would indeed keep the gardening and fill the earth. And when you and I have children, we add to the gardening team. It allows us to fill the earth and subdue and exercise dominion. Let me give you a couple of other verses just to reinforce this idea of procreation. Malachi 2 verse 15 talks about marriage and it answers the question, what for? And it goes on to say offspring. Malachi 2 15, what is God's purpose in marriage? Offspring. And he wants your offspring to become his offspring. He wants you to bear children. He doesn't want you and to disciple him. He just doesn't want you just filling the earth with a bunch of sinners. He wants you bearing children and then, you know, growing them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. 1 Timothy 5 verse 14, again, another verse that shows the the connection between marriage and children. Paul addresses young widows, young wives who have lost their husbands early in life. And he says, here's what I recommend the, the young widows, marry and bear children. But there's the connection, marry and bear children. That's the creation ordinance. What about Psalm 127, 3 to 5? The fruit of the womb is God's reward. And happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. Psalm 128, verses 3 to 4, is a beautiful picture of human flourishing and human happiness. And you've got a man at his table. Alongside him is his wife, who's described as a fruitful vine, She's bearing him children, and around his table are his boys and his girls, little olive plants who are beginning to grow themselves. What a beautiful picture of a growing family as a scene of great happiness. Having children ought not to be delayed, but delighted in. We need to push back on the culture's obsession with family planning. God's plan is the family. God brought the first woman to the first man. And it was God who blessed those first parents with the first child. We read, go to Genesis 4 verse 1. What does Eve say when God gives her a son called Cain? I have a man from the Lord. What a beautiful statement. I have a daughter from the Lord. I have two boys from the Lord. In a day in which the barbarism of late-term abortion reigns, In a day when we have access to and the habitual use of birth control, in a day when society promotes autonomy and self-fulfillment, in a day when couples publicly celebrate the fact that they are childless, don't have you noticed that a few weeks ago, influencers and Hollywood stars celebrating the fact they're childless? You ever wonder what, what would happen to them if their parents were childless? Just a thought. But that's the day we're in. And in that kind of environment, we need to hear this loud and clear. Multiply. God is attached childbearing to marriage. In fact, there's an interesting verse, Genesis 49, 25, where Jacob is blessing his sons towards the end of his life. And he talks about, listen to this, the blessing of breasts and wombs. That's a phrase in Genesis 49, 25. It was a long time since I'd read that verse. The blessing of breasts and wombs. It's children. It's sexual union. It's a blessing. It's a gift from God. Marriage was not intended to remain inward. It was intended to turn outward in the growth of strong societies. Marriage is more than contributing to something bigger than yourself. It's not about selfish consuming and consumption. It's more about giving than receiving. We were designed to have children. Let's look at the male body and the female body. What is a woman? Leave part of that definition, a person with a womb. We were designed to have children. Marriage was intended for children early. Human flourishing involves the raising of children. God wants our offspring to be his offspring and our greatest work and greatest comfort in life will be our children. 
I think this is a good quote by a lady called Rita Gramer. Raising children is probably the most effective form of social action in which most of us will ever engage. Very little that most men and women do is as satisfying or makes as much difference. I hear a lot of young evangelicals talk about social activity, social activism. Here's where you want to start, young person. Get married and have a boatload of children. It's the best social activity you can get involved in. Disciple your children. Send them out into the world as salt and light. And as a further fulfillment of the Great Commission. Like the story of the lady who was pregnant. She had a couple of boys. And she was out with her one of her boys, Ryan, in, in a shopping mall. And as they were out shopping, a woman asked the little boy if he was excited about the new baby that was on its way. And he said, yes. And, and by the way, I know what we're going to call him. Really? Asked the lady. She, and the, the little boy had kind of eavesdropped in a conversation between his mother and some girlfriends the day before. And he said, yes. If it's a girl, we're going to call her Christina. And if it's another boy, we're going to call it quits. <laughs> Well, there might be a time where you call it quits, but not until you've multiplied. Procreation, just, just think about it. Partnership, purpose. Prosperity, purpose. Procreation, purpose. Here's a fourth purpose, pleasure. Pleasure. Marriage affords us a path to great happiness. The singular devoted love of another. It's deeply satisfying, humbling, conversation, companionship. Two is better than one. We get it. But the pleasure I'm thinking about more especially is sexual pleasure. Because while primarily we want to see sex in the service of God, that's how one commentator describes procreation, sex in the service of God, bearing children, discipling children, sending them out into a world for the glory of God. I do want to qualify that, that while sexual union is intrinsically linked to procreation, it is also a means of fulfillment and pleasure. Sex is for procreation, yes, but sex is also for recreation, yes. You're listening to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy and the second part of a message titled Wedding Plans. To replay the full message, visit ktt.org. Well, we want to take a moment to thank our generous listeners and those who give monthly to Know the Truth. Your partnership with this ministry has been instrumental in spreading God's Word boldly and clearly. Through your support, countless lives have been touched by Philip DeCourcy's clear and convicting Bible teaching. As a gesture of our gratitude for your impact, we'd like to send you a copy of the CSB Life Council Bible. This powerful resource features insights from over 150 Christian scholars and is designed to equip you with biblical truth for life's challenges. By becoming a truth ambassador or making a donation, you're not just supporting our ministry, you're actively participating in the Great Commission. And your generosity allows us to reach more people with the life-transforming message of Christ. Imagine the ripple effect as you apply the wisdom from this Bible in your daily life and share it with others. You'll not only be growing in your faith, you'll become a beacon of God's truth in your community. So, if you're ready to amplify the impact of the gospel, call 888-644-8811 or visit ktt.org. Whether you sign up to give monthly as a truth ambassador or give a one-time gift of any amount, a copy of the CSB Life Council Bible is yours. Again, call 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. And if you'd prefer to send a check, you can send it by mail to Know the Truth, Post Office Box 30250, Anaheim Hills, California, 92809. I'm Wayne Shepherd. Come back tomorrow when we'll continue today's message titled Wedding Plans. That's Tuesday on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.